Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to EV Nichols live event. I'm pleased to introduce their president and CEO, Sean Sampson. Sean will take us through the presentation and we'll be accepting questions for a Q&A session at the end. As a reminder, you can submit them in the bottom right hand side of your screen. As always, the summit is being recorded and will be available at six.com to watch afterwards. So without further ado, I hand things over to you, Sean. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, very excited to be able to speak with investors today. We had some big news this morning. That's going to be the majority of my presentation today. And I look forward to uh, additional six events and events with our investors over the coming weeks because we're really getting revved up for a big fall season. So I am hopefully sharing slides with you and can change slides. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, so um, typical legals, uh, make your way through that as we're speaking about some forward-looking um, forward information. But let's talk today about what we announced. We're closing today our oversubscribed financing. We uh, highlighted that to the market earlier this week that it was going to be larger than the $1 million we announced in July. So that's closing for $2.1 million coming into the company. All of that stock has a four-month trading hold on it. Um, it's, it's a big financing. Uh, it took a long time to get this one across the line. What I'm really excited about is, as we mentioned in the release today, participating in this offering are three new strategic investors. These are groups, people and groups, that hold between 5 and 9.9% .9 of the company. Why that's important, those specifics are important, is because once you're above 9.9%, you need to file as an insider, um, and each of these groups are below. We identified two of the groups in today's news release. Um, uh, John Patterson, an individual, is coming onto our board, who I'll speak about in a moment, and then a, a US-based investment group called Hegemon, um, which is basically a, a family office for one specifically high net worth investor. Both John Patterson and uh, Hegemon have received participation rights, which means they're able to um, participate in future financings for the percentage that they own. Now, the third uh, strategic investor is an industrial group, a group from our industry. We're not disclosing them yet, uh, but we hope to down the road, and especially we will if they take advantage of their nomination rights. So nomination rights refers to how each of these three new strategic investors have the right to nominate a director uh, in the vote for our board of directors. And what's really exciting is that one of these three strategic investors, John Patterson, is joining the board immediately. Uh, we gave a bit of John's bio in the news release. Um, he's, a, he's a super experienced guy, comes to the board with having gone through a whole lot of corporate experience. I uh, started out as an attorney. He's now a private investor. Um, he's just done a heck of a lot of stuff, both in Canada and abroad. Um, we actually both worked at Lehman Brothers in New York years ago uh, at the same time. Um, I didn't know John then, but we've met each other in Toronto and I'm really excited for him to be investing in the company and also to come onto our board. So that was the financing, bigger than planned, took a lot longer than planned. Uh, we came on with these three new strategic investors. I'm very excited about that. They'll continue to participate and go forward financings. It provides sort of a running start, as we say here, for future financings, which is exciting. Um, and then also they have nomination rights. So they're, they're gonna be very involved in the company. I should also note that one of the parts one of the, the reasons behind how long this took us was because, and I've said this to investors before, we were trying to be as selective as possible as to where the funding was coming from. Uh, folks know my frustration, especially headed into the summer where our stock was trading off. It seemed as though there were a number of investors who were circling the company, selling down our stock, anticipating they were going to be able to come in on this private placement at a cheaper price. I absolutely did not want to be rewarding those groups. Everybody who took stock on this deal, I know and I've spoken to, and I hope that we've avoided that. 
So that gets very complicated because it means that I was very selective as to which investors I was taking the funds from. We have a big group of existing investors who re-upped and came into the company. We worked very closely with, as we mentioned in the news release, paying finders fees to Power One, a Toronto-based broker. But folks that follow our news release closely can hopefully see a pattern as to sort of who we're working with and who we're not working with. And a big part of that was trying to filter out um, the investors and the potential groups that I felt as though may have been a big part of the anonymous selling before the summertime. So very excited about the financing. It sets us up now with the 2.1 million having come in. It sets us up now very well for what we have planned going forward. The other thing we noted today in the news release is that we're making our final, we gave the math for our final payment to the original vendor of the Langmuir project. So when EV Nickel spun out from Rogue Resources in 2021, there were three parts to the consideration. The first was a bunch of cash and some shares immediately. So Rogue owned 6.6 .6 million shares and continues to own those shares of EV Nickel. The third part was for a payment based on the size of a future resource on the Langmuir. So the area that includes what we call the W4 now. So the third part of that consideration was due. What happened after that original asset purchase agreement was signed with Rogue was that EV Nickel took advantage of an opportunity and bought the exploration land to triple our land package. And that acquired us the Car Lang, which became very exciting. But what it did was delayed getting the W4 resource out. To do that, Rogue had to provide extra time to EV Nickel to get that resource done. And in return, began to draw against this final payment. So what happened, as we all know, uh, is that EV Nickel drilled 8,300 meters up at Car Lang, came out with the enormous large scale resource, but that delayed and it meant that dollars that should have been or would have been uh, based on the original intent of the asset purchase agreement uh, spent and drilled on W4 weren't drilled. So as we mentioned in the release, the two boards have agreed as to what the final payment should be. The final calculation, less the amount that's already been advanced, means that a little over 3.2 million shares are going to Rogue. And that's the end. That's the final payment back to Rogue. The original consideration is complete. That original consideration from the asset purchase agreement in 2021. So that was the other piece of news from today. And really what that sets us up for is we can start talking about you know, where we're at with our investment case. This is a slide we, we show continuously, but this is what we believe. We think there's a wonderful situation in the market right now. Nickel is currently integral to the EVs that are growing like with those hockey stick forecasts. So car companies are making investments right now, pivoting over their uh, manufacturing lines. And what they need is to get their hands on nickel supply. So as they're making those decisions, they're scrambling to put their hands on nickel and it's tricky. So the world requires, and I don't go through my macro in this presentation today, but the real thing to take away from the nickel macro is the world requires 3 million more tons of nickel production by 2035. And for context, those of us sitting here in Ontario, Sudbury produces about 65,000 tons a year, which means almost 50 more Sudburys are required. And it's not just getting your hands on nickel, right? It's complicated because the nickel is not all equal. The new demand requires more from suppliers. So carbon cost is a big feature for the new demand. So the car companies are being forced, starting with the European legislation, which folks expect to go global, where you're going to have disclosure of kilometer zero carbon cost for electric vehicles. That gets very complicated if you're forced to be buying your nickel because the only place you can get your hands on it from uh, high carbon cost Indonesian production, for example. Then if you layer in the geopolitics and you go through the top few nickel producers of the world, it's really a who's who of countries that Western companies don't wanna be dealing with. So 
The obvious one is number three, Russia. Western companies can't even talk to the Russian supply. And then you've got one and two, Indonesia and the Philippines. And I hear this continuously in my conversations with the new demand, the car companies, is that uh, so much money has gone into developing Indonesian and Philippine production from China is that it's almost seen as Chinese supply. So the world is becoming a very small place for these Western companies that need to put their hands on nickel. And it's not just putting your hands on nickel, it's this extra complexity of uh, the carbon cost and the geopolitics. So then if you look at on the supply side, governments seem to be in a bit of an arms race to try to develop their domestic supply chains. We certainly see that in Canada, and we certainly see that in Ontario, where both levels of government are completely aligned on strategy to try to move along new supply for these critical metals. And we're playing exactly in that space. Also, the US with their Inflation Reduction Act, with the uh, constraints they put on, and considering Canada as domestic for the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, it's just all great news for a new low carbon nickel supply that can come on, on market from Ontario. So that sets us up and you know, look at what we have against that sort of scenario. We've got an enormous land package just outside Timmins. It's the best permitting jurisdiction, I think, in the world. Where we are, we would draw on clean hydropower, which is wonderful. And we have two tracks for potential development. We have the high grade W4, which we've doubled the 2010 resource with our drilling there. We have more than 43 million pounds in the ground at just under 1% nickel. And it's all within 400 meters of surface. And then we've got that large scale car lane. It goes for more than 10 kilometers. We drilled the first 20% and came out with the A zone. The A zone has over a billion tons with over 2.4 million tons of contained nickel. And that's at 0.24% nickel and it's at surface going right along. So that's exactly the type of mineralization that you can build a multi-generation nickel producer. So we've got the resources. And then of course, we're working on our trademark term, the clean nickel research and development, where we're focusing in on the lowest possible carbon cost. And we have government money funding that, and uh, we have lab research underway. And that's a big part of what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of this year. So what we sum it up to is we have an enormous undeveloped nickel project. It's in the top 10 globally, and we trade at just a minute fraction of what those top 10 projects trade for. We think it represents a tremendous valuation opportunity. So here's what I've been talking about for folks who are new to it. We're just outside Timmins. Timmins is a great place to be right near. Uh, it is 1,000 kilometers from Windsor, Detroit, which is where much of this new demand I refer to is gonna be popping up. Um, and it's served by clean hydropower, as I mentioned. So we're less than 50 kilometers away. And on our land package, we have the large scale Car Lang, the billion ton resource in the north. And then we have our high grade W4. And just across the street from the high grade W4 is a privately held high grade deposit called the Heart. Plus there's a permitted operating mill on the Shaw Dome called the Redstone Mill. That's also owned by a private company. That company is an investor of ours. So there's wonderful synergies. It's a wonderful location to have all this just outside of the city of Timmins. So let me run you through sort of what we've done so far and then what we plan to do. So if I wind things back to 2021, we launched the company. We did that original transaction with Rogue. We came out with a tech report and then we came out public on the TSXV. Then 2022, that was expansion and discovery last year, right? We did the transaction to triple our land package. We got the car lang through that deal. We launched our trademark clean nickel R&D strategy. Uh, we announced our lease and rofer arrangement on the Carshaw Mill. That's a mothballed mill also on the Shaw Dome. And we made discoveries. The W4 extension, the deeper mineralization at W4, that was announced last year. 
plus having discovered up at the Car Lang, and then a new zone down in Groves to the south. Then what's been happening in the first half of this year is we came out with these resources. So the Car Lang A zone, the first 20% of Car Lang trend, that was the billion ton resource at 0.24, all within um, you know, spitting distance of surface. We had announced a, a PDAC this year, a $500,000 investment from the province of Ontario, very supportive of our research and development. And then we came out with our new updated W4 resource before the summer, which as I mentioned, doubled, more than doubled the 2010 resource, gave us 43.4 million pounds of nickel in all resource categories. And that's at 0.98 percent nickel and this news today that we aligned with the new strategic investors what we've got going forward this year is exciting we're going to be coming out very soon with a bunch of clean nickel r d results we've been very busy in the lab both on the tank bio leach and the carbon mineralization that news is just ahead and then we are going to outline what i refer to as our project concept so that's gonna be how we see the pieces of the puzzle fitting together. And we'll be able to talk about this wonderful potential business on the Shaw Dome just outside Timmins. So the project concept that will also help set up our discussions around permitting and we'll lay out the permitting and study pathway for us, how it looks to get from here to potential production. Uh, and that's very exciting because we have the potential now that we have much of our exploration risk behind us with the resource on the books. Now we can focus in and chart out that path between here and being able to provide new supply that can potentially uh, work with that new demand that's developing in the nickel market. So it's all very exciting as we propel ourselves ahead. The news today was a big step forward, both the dollars that came in and who it came from and who's partnering with us. Very excited about that. And we've got a lot to talk about in the coming weeks. So Kyle, that's my quick drive by primarily of the news. Um, are there any questions that have come in from the investors? There we go. Thank you, Sean. We had some pre-submitted questions. As a reminder, you can submit in the bottom right-hand side of your screen if you have any questions. But we'll start with the email questions first. Uh, first question, rather direct one. How can you justify all of this dilution? Right, so that's the that's the big question, right? Uh, we did a low priced private placement because that's where the stock was. Um, we got pushed into this situation. We needed to raise money, but the way a company of our size and at our stage continues to grow is we need to take in investment to move ourselves forward. So there will be always be dilution, right? We What we're planning to do is bring in a potential mega project. That's the Car Lang A zone. And to do that, we're certainly not gonna be able to do it with just the shares that we've sold uh, you know, prior to summer. So dilution was gonna have to happen. And it really hurts, of course, because it dilutes all of us. And I think first as an investor, but here's the thing. We wanted to make sure if we did this dilution, it was with the right people. So we put the shares, I believe, into the right hands. And you've heard me say that we spent a heck of a lot of time trying to filter through interest for this private placement and put it into the right hands. And I think with today's announcement, you'll, you'll have seen and you'll see more of as we go down the path here, partnering with these three new strategic investors definitely put it in the right hands because what we're doing is genuinely partnering, partnering with deep pockets, deep expertise. And I think if you're going to have dilution, you want to have the best possible dilution. And really that's what our focus has been with this financing. So great question. No great answer. Uh, dilution is bad, but it was inevitable. But I think we've done sort of the best possible dilution and been the smartest we could be in terms of who we gave the shares to. Thank you. I appreciate hearing the strictness of this. And that leads into the second question rather nicely. With these strategic investors, how did you do this due diligence on them? Are they mining focused? Can you talk a little bit further about these strategic investors? Yeah. So um, John, 
who's coming on our board right away is not mining focused. He is a generalist investor who was initially lined up with us through connections and was initially drawn to us uh, based on the value, the value play of the company. <clears throat> so it's very important to note that the two of the three strategic investors, investors, as mentioned today in the news release, are generalist financial investors. They are not resource focused. So they were originally attracted in based on the value. They spent a considerable amount of time doing due diligence on the value proposition of EV Nickel. They were very attracted in and they've subsequently come in um, for the dollars they invested. So it, it's an important point though, that we didn't go back to just the usual wells. And I may sound like a uh, you know, broken record on this one, but at the risk of repeating myself, I will. We were very selective about who we took money from. And it's very exciting to be able to tap into new sources of funding who aren't just the usual suspects, let's say. So we mentioned that we have great support from some of our existing shareholders. I was very selective on that. And I'm very pleased with who is alongside us on this financing. And I'm very excited about tapping into new sources of funding because it's a great thing for a guy trying to run a company, telling his story, having it attract new people to the story, which is really part of the puzzle that we require if we're going to build this thing to what we intend it to be. So not mining focused or resource focused guys, generalists, and we'll be able to tap into, I hope, more generalists from here and really tap into as well their expertise and their networks. That's interesting that John is a generalist investor, but he, how did that discussion happen to that he becomes a member of the board of EV Nickel? Yeah, so the amount of money he was investing, it's somewhat typical for um, you know large investors like that when they put in that much money that they ask for typically rights alongside that. So that's why all three of the strategic investors got participation rights plus uh, forms of a nomination right. So John got a two-year nomination, as we noted in the news release, um, and that's sort of normal course for an investor writing that size of ticket, especially if they want to be really involved in the trajectory of, of the company at our stage. So I'm excited to have him on. I'm very glad that he and the other strategic investors asked for that nomination right, because it really you know, has them at the table alongside me as we're trying to figure out to how we grow this thing. Definitely. And since we're talking about the finance and um, for your research component of EV Nickel, have you looked at new federal programs that are available for funding? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've been you know, aligned with the provincial government very closely from before the announcement of their investment in March of this year. Uh, but we continue to be actively involved with various ministries at Queen's Park. At the federal level, uh, we have received funding from the federal government through IRAP and other research-specific funding sources. But NRCAN, the Natural Resource Ministry, has announced a big uh, critical minerals-focused innovation fund. Looks a lot like the one that we were successful on with Ontario, but the feds have announced that out of NRCAN. That's up to a $5 million multi-year investment towards R&D. We are applying for that, uh, working on that right now with a group of partners. So we're working with Northern College out of Timmins. In addition, we're planning to get letters of support uh, from our provincial partners at the government level, plus we hope other local stakeholders in the Timmins area. So it's federal money uh, it's interesting that investors pick up on this because it's been in the news. Uh, the way that they wrote that federal grant program, uh, and we've been in talks for a long time with the political staff and on the bureaucrat side as well, as they structured this program, it's as it looks a lot like the one we were successful on with the province of Ontario, it's directly sort of in the bullseye of what we're doing. So we're excited to be applying for that. And that's a big focus over the next few months, getting that application in. Thank you. Uh, direct to the Q&A chat now. David had a question. He's just wondering how many shares are outstanding as of today. 
Uh, shoot, that's a question I should know. It's, uh, what are we added 35 million? So it, I think it was in the news release. Uh, I don't have it up myself. Yeah. Uh, let me, I can come back to you on that one. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. We'll go to the next question here. So now that you have some strategic investors, is there any prospect of strategic's interest in taking some of your product? So, yeah, hey, so, um, and I, I know folks will want to know more about the strategic investors, but we're going to say what we uh, have said um, about them. So, there are two that were named financial investors. Uh, they're not uh, industry players, so they're not going to necessarily take our product. But you've heard me say before that we are working with and continue to work with, you know, members of industry. So in my mind, it would be wonderful to be able to get partnership with car companies, a uh, car company or a battery company, or perhaps both, um, larger miners. And then you've also heard me mention mining private equity, but sort of a technical group that can really sort of give their you know, seal of approval on the technical work we're doing and then um, representation from the new demand. So those are the two groups that have really been uh, working hard to try to get um, them informed and, and in on our story. I've also mentioned that this group, the car company and battery company group, um, they don't speak resource language as well as they will talk PEA. They understand dollars much better than they understand geology. So I'm very focused in on this group for when we get our PEAs out um, because I know, and this new demand is so focused on trying to get their hands on the right supply that we should have great interest from those groups once we've got a PEA across the line. So folks have heard me talk about strategic investors uh, from industry. So the question about whether a strategic investor that we're talking about today uh, would take any of our material. I, I don't want to go ahead and say that because uh, I don't want to put more of the picture as to who that group is. Um, but folks have known we've been working on the strategy to bring in strategic investors from within our industry. Uh, we're continuing on that. Today's announcement was part of that. Uh, but I hope that you'll hear more about uh, our strategic investor as perhaps as they invest uh, more in the company. Um, or as we go further down the path and it becomes more part of their public story. Great. And this leads into my next question. Well, from the audience, you mentioned the PEA and an individual is wondering more about charting the path. Is there a more specific timeline on permitting and the study pathway? Yeah. So we've talked publicly before about um, internally, we refer to it as our pedal down plan. So uh, if we keep the pedal pinned, uh, how quickly can we get everything permitted for the high-grade W-4 and the large-scale car lang? in addition to having your feasibility studies complete? We've talked about how the pedal-down plan is sort of a five-year plan looking out. Um, I don't want to put firm dates on it because we're still going to set that path up, uh, but that is really what I hope to be able to paint the picture of uh, not just saying, you know, we'll get to that point in five years, but here's what the stages look like between here and there, both on the permitting track and then on the studies track. So um, let me get that out when we talk about what the path forward looks like in the coming weeks and months. But that's really a focus for the rest of 2023 is to get the details behind that. I've got an internal model, uh, but we need to figure out more about that in addition to having conversations with the regulators to ensure that permitting track we've really got understood and then we'll be able to speak about it more publicly great and alfonso did the math or looked at the press release for us so yeah. thank you but in the 86.4 is the new so thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have one more question here. How profitable do you think the carbon capture operations could be to you? Yeah. Um, uh, well, it's it's certainly worth exploring. We don't have dollars on it yet, so it would be premature to talk about profitability. But part of the news we'll have in the coming weeks has been 
our success as we've been trying to uh, calculate sort of the size of that prize uh, from a, a technical side, from the how much carbon can you um, can you mineralize? Um, the question about profitability speaks to, well, what would the costs be to get that carbon mineralized? And then what would you get paid for it? So the what would you get paid for it is a market. It's kind of like me talking about producing nickel in five years. Uh, folks can form a view. Um, there's a similar view for what the, the, the price, so the revenue side of that profitability number would be five years from now. So um, baby steps on this one. What we hope to come out with very soon is um, sort of the size of the prize and what the potential is as to how much we could capture. The costs against that, we won't be talking about in a few weeks. That'll be part of future studies. But that should give investors an idea once they hear our coming news on carbon mineralization as to how big the potential is. Uh, in terms of the specific question about profitability, uh, it's, it's, it's early for me to be talking about dollars. Great. Thank you, Sean. And that's it for the questions in the audience. So if you tuned in late, just as a reminder, we are recording this so you can watch the full conversation afterwards in the coming days. But I will leave it to you, Sean, for any closing remarks. Yeah. Hey, um, Kyle, I'm not in the chat, but uh, so the, the numbers were we added 35 million today, which brings us to 86.4. Does that match what was in the chat? Yes. 86.397.271. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Super. Okay. Well, to round it out, uh, thanks everyone. This was a, a really an update about our news today, which hopefully you can you can pick up from me uh, our level of enthusiasm about having got to this point, and perhaps a bit more explanation about why it took so long, and, and also why we upsized to be double. Um, so we're, we're very excited about where we're standing and and where we're going as well. So in the coming weeks and months, you're going to have uh, news from us on the clean nickel R&D, plus much more of being able to paint out the path forward, uh, which we're excited about because we're, we're back to talking about progress with the company and not just uh, trying to bring dollars in the door for the near term. So thank you again for participating. Uh, we are available. Um, info at is a way to always be able to contact me. And I look forward to sharing more information as we as we go down the path. Mm -hmm.